things that we've been doing this year that's been a little bit different is we've been highlighting an activity related to the topic this month. This month we're looking at an area of research in astrobiology. So Vivian White has this month's activity, which you can also find in the NSN Life in the Universe Outreach Toolkit. So over to you, Vivian. Hi, everybody. It's great to see so many people on this presentation. Um, I'm just going to start off and quickly go over a really fun activity called Life in the Extreme. Uh, this is, like you said, from the Life in the Universe uh, toolkit, which you can get on the Night Sky Network. Um, yes, thanks, Brian, for putting a list in there. Um, uh, this is a great activity that is really engaging with your audience. We, it comes with this uh, introduction card that has all the presentation steps on the back, which is really uh, a nice thing to have. What you do is you start off with a question, something like, let's see, who thinks there might be life elsewhere in our galaxy? Or what kinds of world do you think aliens might live on? Um, and you say, actually, we don't know, but we are studying it. And scientists are looking to extreme environments and the organisms that live in those environments to study what the possibilities of life looks like. So you would then hand out all these different cards. We have everything from penguins to like, and this is um, definitely the kids' favorite, snotites, very cool. Um, and my favorite, the water bear. So there are 14 different cards. You can make copies of these. You can download them. On the back of each of these cards, it has some information about each of the organisms that talks about the temperature and what kind of pressure and how much water they need and the acidity that they can live in. So then you start to ask them to sort themselves by and there are lots of different options on the back of your presenter card. Say, you know, how, who lives in a really cold environment and um, everyone sorts themselves to the right or to the left. And there are, um, you do this four or five different times, who lives in high acidic, very acidic environments or who lives in high temperatures. And they sort themselves out and you can see that there are variations on that uh, spectrum for all of these different things. And then, Kind of the punchline of this is who can live without water and nobody none of the uh, organisms that we found on earth can live without water they can't they can't live and thrive without water i should say um so it points to the fact that we use water as a way to look for life life elsewhere in the universe uh, and it's a fun activity with some good uh follow-ups that you can go through it's great with a group um you i even do it print out a couple of different sets of them. You can even make your own if you'd like uh, of different organisms. I know some of the parks that we work with make their own um, for the organisms that uh, live in their park environment. So um, this is from the Life in the Universe Toolkit and it was produced by us here at the Astronomical Society of the Pacific and sponsored by JPL's Exoplanet Exploration Program and the Virtual Planetary Labs. So um, thanks to them, you can get that on the NSN. And I am gonna, I think it's gonna relate quite a bit to the talk we're having tonight, so enjoy. Great, thank you, Vivian. Okay, so now to our featured presentation. Bruce Damer is a Canadian-American multidisciplinary scientist, designer, and author. At UC Santa Cruz, Dr. Damer collaborates with Professor David Deemer and other colleagues developing and testing a new model for the origin of life on Earth. For NASA and the space industry, he works on the design of spacecraft architectures to provide a viable path for expansion of human civilization beyond the Earth. He began his career in the 1980s, developing some of the earliest user interfaces for personal computers, led the community in the 1990s, bringing the first multi-user virtual worlds to the internet, and has spent 25 years chronicling the history of computing in his Digibarn Computer Museum. Please welcome Bruce Damer. Hello, everyone. Let me just share my screen. Let me get this done here. So, uh, how can the panelists hear me? It's uh, everything's a okay. Looks great. Sounds great. <laughs> You're our mission control there. <laughs> well, great. wonderful. Uh, I want to really thank the Astronomical Society of the Pacific and. Uh, all of you out there for attending. And I'm gonna take you on a journey. Uh, and that journey is gonna take us uh, to the far reaches of Australia, deep into pools in Yellowstone, 
uh, back in time to the Archean and Hadean Earth, uh, out to Mars and on to Enceladus and, and exoplanets, which I think is a, a tasty set of delights for many of you there. Uh, astronomy was the original field that, that started us out uh, really as a, as a science. I think in some ways, astrobiology is, is docked into and was, was created into being by astronomers. So that's why it's astrobiology. So let's get started. So part one is the origin of life. We have two parts here. We have the origin of life and the search for life in the universe. They're both life topics, but uh, this one's lodged primarily on the earth. So if you look at this picture, you see it's sunlight pulling forward uh, life. Uh, as we know it. And this is the clue as to life's origins. So when did this start? It started for me and when I was 14 years old in 1976. Uh, and as uh, was Brian mentioned, I'm from Canada. So this is a, a sagebrush hill near my town in Kamloops, British Columbia. And I was walking out in the hills and up was coming a flower, a mariposa lily. And I bent down to study it and thought, what a beautiful structure, you know, but how can, how can a structure like this, which is complex, come from a simple thing like a seed or a bulb? And I thought, that's pretty interesting. I didn't know about algorithms and software and computers and genetic codes. And then I remembered I just read about this guy, Albert Einstein, who did thought experiments when he was in his teen years. And one of his famous ones was riding alongside a beam of light you know, running alongside it. And it led to special relativity. So I thought, well, that's how you do science. You do thought experiments. So I did one. And this is the first thought experiment because I asked myself the question or asked whatever, the question to the universe, what created all of life? Not just one bulb or seed, but the or bulb or seed. <clears throat> and this is what came into my mind, which is a seething mass of molecules trying to self-organize. And I kind of asked it a question, but it asked me a question, which was, how did we make a copy of myself or ourselves? How did we figure that out? How did we make a copy of ourselves? And I thought, well, how can a seething mass of molecules, like a bunch of Lego blocks, how can that self-assemble into something? You, know, you just can't sort of shake a bucket of Lego blocks and have it do anything. You know, this is Fred Hoyle's argument. Uh, and basically, the seething mass of molecules asked me to figure it out. And it took me uh, 40, 38 years, actually, uh, working with colleagues to come up with this model. Because I thought, you know, if you need a, if you're going to make a machine, you need another bigger machine, right? An automobile should be made in an automobile factory. So how do you make a complex machine without a bigger machine there? So this guy, Charles Darwin, was one of the first persons in, the, in science to try to figure it out. And he had worked out uh, evolution through natural selection uh, you know, in his work and his tra travels on the Beagle in 1835. And he, at the end, toward the end of his life, in a letter to his friend Hooker, wrote this famous phrase. And everybody knows the warm little pond part of it. But really what actually the, the pay dirt uh, for this thing is later in the, the phrase where he talks about all sorts of ammonia, phosphoric salts, light heat electricity, which is all right, it's all good. But this is the key one. A protein compound was chemically formed, ready to undergo still com more complex changes. And he actually nailed it. This is actually the fundamental thing you have to do to start life, is to grow polymer and then extend it and allow it to undergo complex changes. That is it. If you're not making polymers in length, you're not going to get to life. So our field, the science of the origin of life, uh, sort of got really started in 1952-53 with the Miller-Urey spark chamber experiment. Everybody knows about that. Prior to that, in the 1920s through 50s, Haldane and Oparin talked about soups. 
and their concept was you needed uh, to have more complex things made from simpler things and you need to concentrate them somehow. Uh, in the 1970s, the deep sea hydrothermal vents were discovered and we actually just met, uh, met some of the people who were on running the Alvin who did this, it's just fascinating. Uh, and it was suggested later that perhaps the life could begin in these extremophile environments. However, in 30 years of laboratory work, uh, there's never been uh, the demonstration of a polymer of any length that could be formed in <clears throat> continuously aqueous environments like this, and not uh, the formation of membranous uh, capsules either. So as of really last year at our Origin of Life meeting uh, in San Diego, it was very clear that the chemistry community is now returning its focus to land-based pools because we can get the chemistry to work. So that's a big tidal shift, uh, if you will, in the field of the origin of life. So now I'm gonna take you back to a place that few origin of life researchers uh, go uh, because mostly uh, our field is dominated by chemists and we use clean glassware and order reagents from catalogs and try to get things to work in you know, a single reaction to work. But nature is complex and life started on the surface of a world in, in a complex environment. And the only place you can go to get a clear view of the oldest uh, environments for life on earth is this one little chunk of Northwestern Australia called the Pilbara. And we went on a field trip there in July 15, 2015, Dave and I, and it started in Perth and it went up to Carnarvon, uh, a place called Shark Bay, which I'll show you here, which is a saline estuary. It's now a World Heritage Site. And then it continued on. But at Shark Bay, we got off our bus and we actually snorkeled or we looked under the water to these interesting structures called stromatolites. And they're not rocks, they're made by biology. They're literally grown by biofilms that sequester sand grains and build these towers in order to keep having access to the light. They're pulled forward by light. There's me standing at the shores of, of Shark Bay. And this is like standing in the Archean or standing in some ancient time. You know, it's, it's amazing because this would have been a scene, you know, familiar to time travelers 3.5 billion years ago. If you press down on the tops of these structures, it's a spongy film of, uh, of trillions of microbiota, the top layer being, of course, cyanobacteria. So onwards we drove to this northwestern region, and this kind of uh, looks like almost like a caldera, which actually turns out it is, is the North Pole Dome, the best preserved landscape of the Paleoarchean 3.5 billion years ago. So there's our bus and our utes, some of the geology. This is a place mostly visited by geologists. Here's a slab of stromatolite 2.6 billion years old. You can see the layering again by the successive growths of, of a microbial mat. Here's a top view of stromatolite. So these are the ancient cousins of the living stromatolites of Shark Bay. There's a sort of side view. And here's a stromatolite bedded in chert. That's that black material on the top and bottom. And so this is this actually, uh, chert often can preserve evidence for microfossils very controversial in our field, but it's really been established that single uh, imprints of single cells have been found in chert. It's very, very rare of the chert of this age. But in between, there's the morphological evidence. And stromatolites don't leave any organics. This is, this is basically a mineral substructure that's uh, cemented together that is then preserved. And it can be preserved sort of carbonaceously or, or through silica replacement. This is Martin Van Cranendonk, who's sort of in charge of the, of the dresser formation in Pilbara region. This is me looking through a loop at some of the structures in the Strelly Pool formation. 
And this is the famous Strelly Pool Formation, which was the discovery outcrop for stromatolites. It's about 3.46 billion years old of age. So in 2014, uh, evidence was discovered in by Martin Van Kranendonk and Tara Jokic that in fact uh, the North Pole Dome is, was ringed by hot springs. It was not a marine shore as previously thought. And they determined this by the discovery of this geyserite, which you'll you see there. It's basically uh, bands of light and dark material laid down by splashing geysers, fresh water at the surface. This is a remarkable discovery. And within the geyserite, there's evidence of palisade fabric, which is solidified microbial filaments. So on the left, you see modern filaments, and on the right, you see the solidified versions. Uh, they also discovered what looked like evidence for air bubbles within uh, this material, evidence of uh, so-called EPS that glues together microbial biofilms. And you can see on the bottom, there's some modern, this goo gooey stuff that microbes use to tie their communities together. And when they produce oxygen, it goes out as, as bubbles. So this is not only the oldest uh, evidence for life on land that's ever been discovered, uh, but it, and the oldest hot spring on Earth by three, you know, by 3.5, you know, 2 billion years, but it's the first evidence, possibly the oldest for metabolism. So if we look at the rock record, uh, from the earliest evidence for life, it actually turns out vibrant life at 3.5 billion years in, in a hot spring location on land. This is a, a sample I picked up uh, two years ago. This is barite preserved stromatolite. Here's a lakeshore stromatolite, which is a little bit less diverse because it's in a quiescent environment. And this is sort of produced by onlapping waves. And this is modern marine uh, stromatolites, also a little bit more of a quiescent environment, a little less diverse, but still, you know, very, very vibrant. So this is suggesting, the rock record suggests that far from life crawling out on land sometime, you know, half a billion years ago, life was always on the land in aqueous environments. So let's take a look at what this implication, uh, this evidence now means. That if land masses say at four billion years ago, perhaps around the time of life's origins, uh, they certainly were present. There was a, there was thinking earlier that we had a complete water world, but this is actually not plausible because, you know, on a cooling mantle on a rocky road, you're gonna have a vast amount of volcanic activity and a vast amount of hot springs, you know, both under the ocean and on the land masses. You know, think Hawaii or Kamchatka or, or Iceland today. So they actually believe now that even in the Hadean, there was at least potentially 30 to 40 percent of the, the surficial land mass. So lots of land, and what land has is a property that the ocean doesn't. When you have things deposit on the land, they concentrate. So, you know, think of, of a rainfall and you find a little pool that has kind of salts or things built up around it. You can actually concentrate material, whereas the ocean is a big, big diluting buffer. This has been the main problem chemists have had with an origin of life in the ocean. It's a diluting environment. So you're gonna lose all your reagents. If you're dilute, you can't form a bond. You can't form chemical bonds. If you can't do that, you can't get to life. So it turns out that the oceans, is, it's, the oceans themselves are an extremophile environment for early life. But perhaps the Goldilocks zone, and this is a term from astrobiology, for early life are these little pools that are fluctuating, that have just the right temperature and the right chemical composition. So if early Earth, Earth had hundreds of millions of years to establish adaptations, it could do it on the land because you had a system where you could collect material and there was a lot of infall in those years. The infalling material contained the building blocks of life. It contained fatty acids, amino acids, and nucleobases. Now these are 
known to have come in on carbonaceous chondrites. We have a meteorite collection, which includes the pieces of the Murray and the Murchison meteorite, which are at the age of the earth, pretty much. They're 4.6 billion years old, and they contain all these organics. So this material as dust or meteorites is falling on the land, concentrating in pools where they can be, it can be cycled, chemical reactions happen. And then if you get a form of early life, it can then flow downstream, adapt and be stressed until it hits the salty and high tidal environments and high divalent cation environments of the oceans, adapt to that later and then distribute like we saw at Shark Bay. So, you know, Dave has never been satisfied with just doing stuff in clean glassware. So this is one of his first trips. We went, you know, he went uh, 10, 12 years ago to Kamchatka, Russia, found a little warm pool that was driven by hydrothermal activity and put in a, a set of uh, reagents and membranous structures formed immediately in this little pool. You may as well try it in the field. So the feedstock from meteoritic compounds as a piece of the Murchison meteorite would have been falling in these pools in, in abundance. Then Dave made this discovery that he could actually polymerize non-enzymatic. That, that means put together polymers without the building blocks of life, without the tools of life, without enzymes, through hydration and dehydration cycling. So building this chamber at UC Santa Cruz, we have the, these 24 vials that move around between a hydration station and a dehydration station. And if we put in solutions, we put in, say, a, a slightly acidic mixture, pH 3, with the presence of AMP and UMP, which are two of the building blocks of RNA, they stack together with introduced lipid, various lipids, and lipid is what you are made of, is what your cell walls are made of. Lipid is the organizing principle of life itself. So if lipid is present in these pools from meteoritic infall, it's going to form membranes. When the pools dry down, they're going to squeeze together all the monomers, all the building blocks, and you're going to get what are called, in this case, diester bond formation. Because it turns out that the, the nucleic acids and the amino acids that make the polymers of your body need to dry down in order to form those polymers. Now, life does this with ATP that kicks the water out, but these are called condensation reactions. So you have to get rid of water in order to form these polymers. The only way nature has to do that is to dehydrate. So there's no way to do it in, in a deep ocean vent environment like you'd find maybe at an Enceladus. It's a conundrum. So here's our, our product that was formed. Here's our gels that form. We're forming up to 150 base unit long RNA-like polymers in just a few hours. It's an amazing discovery. So those are our gels and our nanopore sequencing device, which we invented years ago, actually pulls these RNAs through and counts the bases. So this is actually RNA. We're now self-assembling DNA this way. Amazing. So we don't have to necessarily have an RNA world first. So hydration, dehydration, cycling, or wet-dry cycling can also be used to make peptides. Several groups have done this. So here I am at Bumpus Hell in uh, placing into a fumarole vent a slide tray with a little bit of solution of this lipid and AMP and UMP. Uh, and letting vent gases alone, just hydration and dehydration through moist gases, go across the sample. And we make uh, a little bit of RNA in just uh, this environment uh, in, up here in Lassen National Park. So it worked there. There we went out to Yellowstone last June. And here you have uh, this pattern that you see. Here's a silicious hot spring. Uh, this dome that it's on was made by the fluids because the fluids have a lot of dissolved silica, which comes out of solution into these gel-like, you know, boundaries, which then harden into sinter. And then the, the waters are flowing down and they go from chemical eaters to sun eaters, photosynthetic, from chemo, 
chemotropes to photoautotropes. There's the pattern right there. And in the center all around are green, basically cyanobacteria everywhere. And this could have been the force that oxygenated the atmosphere. These protected from UV photoautotrophs. What I did was put these solutions into our vials and shook them up and, and by golly, we produced vesicles. So we had lipid uh, introduced into hot spring waters and we were able to, to produce vesicles uh, in various pHs in Yellowstone, 3.3 to 8. So what happens when you do wet dry cycling is when you have the dry layer at the bottom of your dish and you rehydrate your dish or your pool, the dried layers bud off trillions of these vesicles and they contain random polymers that were synthesized between the layers. So you have a combinatorial engine that can create what we call protocells. And every cycle you do, you get more of them because you're producing more polymers and more protocells. Can't do this in, in any other environment than a wet drying pool. So how does this lead to life? Well, let's take a metaphor from computer science. You're all nerds, right? You know, 40 years ago, I was the weird computer guy. You know, now we're all weird computer people. Well, the metaphor from computer science is how could you write programs uh, from scratch without a programmer? Well, you'd start with a random paper tape puncher and a big feed of, of paper tapes. And these are the original uh, medium for programming microcomputers. And there's a tape reader that takes these random tapes into a primitive computer. This is an Altair 8800 from my computer collection. And this computer has this, an energy source, that's all important. And it, what it does is it takes these paper tapes and it can run them in a cycle. And the cycle's done through a thing called a microprocessor, which runs these random instructions. And these are programs, and some, most of the programs crash, and they're selected out into the crash trash, but one program works. It's called Program A, and it works. It lights up some lights on the front of the computer, and so we decide, the system decides, rather, to take Program A and punch another program, B, C, and D, and attach it to A, and then run it again. And by golly, one of them, it may be AC, generates a computer that has a little bit more to it. Maybe it has a screen and a keyboard. Punch, punch more of those. AC and F may generate uh, a laptop. AC, F, and I may generate uh, a smartphone. And this is the evolution of software and hardware together. And this is inefficient, but would work. It's arguably that this would generate programs that work. As long as you're in a cycling system that's fed by energy and new building blocks, pretty, pretty commonsensical, huh? It's very inefficient, so we pay uh, slightly more efficient things called engineers to do it for us. So where do we find this in nature? We find this here. The organics coming in from the solar system. The polymerizer is our little layers of lipid with our monomers that are stacking together and making our polymers. Our polymers are our programs. The computer that's running the program is our warm little cycling pool. Here's our Charlie Darwin, it's his computer, and it's driven by an energy system, several energy systems. The programs are protocells, which we just showed you how we make. And here's Charlie Darwin, he's our our program tester and, and his, uh, he decides whether or not uh, the, the protocells pop or they do not. If they pop, they lose their contents. If they don't, they survive and they go through another cycle because they go back down to the bottom of the dish, refuse with the membranes that are there and repolymerize. This is the evolution of software and hardware together in a chemical Buddha. So here's our full cycle mechanism for an origin of life in a cycling hot spring pool. And this has all been demonstrated in the laboratory. So here's our dry phase. There's a freeze fracture of our lipid lamellae. Here's what happens after we add the water back in. And we get all these butted off protocells with random polymers. There's our testing of the protocells for stability. 
The stable ones, you can see the one with the purple polymer in it, is delivered back down into the sludge at the bottom of the pool, which we used to just think was a collecting sludge, and now we think it's actually the common ancestor of all life. We call this a gel phase. Carl Woese called it a progenote. And you can see a little bit of a micrograph there of stacked together protocells that are fusing back into the layers. So what this is, what chemists call this, is a, a, a kinetic trap where the rate of polymer synthesis exceeds the rate of hydrolysis. So you continually get resynthesis. This is Charles Darwin. A protein compound shall be formed that becomes increasingly complex. This is it right here. So we believe this is the, the engine that can generate uh, the living world. So let's put it all together. So here's our wonderful graphic, which we took two years to put together with all of our colleagues around the world. Hot spring origin of life. So synthesis of, of the building blocks in space and some of them coming from the hydrothermal system itself as well from below. Accumulation on land, can't do that in the ocean, see it raining down. This stuff still accumulates in your gutters, you know, these micrometeorites. Concentration in a series of pools of different pHs, chemistry, so it produces organics. You see the organics, self-assembled membrane structures. Uh, these organics, if they find their way into a cycling pool or cycle, are subject to this combinatorial selection process which generates these masses, these uh, sludges, which can flow downstream. And you'll notice in item number five, we flowed out of our cycling pool, and which, where we were feeding from chemicals. Now we're in a dilute environment of a lake. We must feed from the sun, which means we must develop some kind of a pigment energy capture system. The, system, uh, the protocellular mass would have just died off or stopped working. And this is where we think that uh, cell division had to come in somewhere along here as you exit the chemical feeding zone. You have to have learned the trick of cell division. So the progenote becomes the living cell mass or the ancestral microbial mat. So adaptation to not only lake shores, but the saline estuary, which means you have to have active pores to get the salt out because uh, the cytosol matches a hot spring fluid, fresh water, much more, it's, it's, it's much more than a you know, seawater. The cells do not have a seawater composition. So after all that, you have robust microbial communities able to build the marine stromatolites that we see at Shark Bay. So we have global distribution. But this is a downhill gradient, but an uphill uh, adaptational uh, path for making more and more robust life. And this form of life dominates the earth for 90% of its history. So the rock record supports it. There's our hot springs, stromatolite, lake shore, and marine. So this has now been in publication in our field for about three, four years, but Scientific American picked it up on the August 2017 uh, cover. Uh, we bumped the eclipse off the cover. I noticed a uh, picture of Dave uh, Brian there is at the Oregon Eclipse, clearly. Uh, and we bumped it off the cover because the uh, editor is a microbiologist and she felt this was a, the most important story they might publish in that decade, which doesn't felt nice to us. But they took our, our graphic, this is my artwork, and they, they did uh, this wonderful treatment with this spiraling wet, dry, moist, wet, dry, moist cycle. So this is going to be republished, I think, in a month in a special issue on science for the 21st century. So let's take a slight pause here. And let's ask ourselves, uh, for the, the true uh, geeks, the combinatorial uh, physics geeks among us, we might ask the question at this point, what are the abstract properties of the system that can take inanimate matter and take it toward animate matter. You know, in a sense, it's sort of the God particle, the God property, you might call it. Uh, what is the process? Now we've seen the physical process within geology and within chemistry that we believe can do this and that is working experimentally in the lab and in the field up to a certain point. Uh, we haven't seen the emergence of a genetic function or 
complex things like pores, but it's, it's, it's a predictive system. We, we believe that cycle long enough, uh, chemists will actually see the evolution of these polymers. But let's ask the question, what is the actual abstract parts of the process? So I did a thought experiment, another one one night, where I visualized the plane of physics, the undulating plane of physics. You push down on one place, and it, it predictably moves in another, maybe a sort of classical thing. And then within that plane, I placed a, a protocell. I said, what are the properties of this protocell? Oh, they crowd things together to make them more likely. They're a, a probability shaping system. But if you have two protocells next to each other, they, the membrane sort of butt up against each other and there's a transmission of smaller molecules. This is message passing. Message passing isn't really done in physics, but it's done in this system. So things can transmit and affect other th systems, which then, then can act back. If you get a lot of these, these protocells together, you get a combinatorial system that does shapes probability and has more message passing. It's not a living system yet. But if you look at the three plots that this would produce abstractly, this increases the probability of chemical reactions increases a network effect, and it generates something quite magical. This is the substrate on which you can generate informational polymers, like we're doing now with a self-assembly of RNA and DNA. So once you get an informational polymer, you have a three-phase engine that can bootstrap reality beyond physics. And it looks like this, a probability-shaping engine, creates an interconnection network which grows and it, from which emerges a memory system, which of course when you have a memory system you get more probabilistic things happening uh, more likely and more interconnected, etc. It goes and goes and goes. So I sort of thought to myself, and this was a comment at a conference, that uh, perhaps this is kind of somebody said, well what you're doing is you're kind of creating a second Copernican revolution. Of course, you guys are astronomers. It's like, well, what does this, what does this have to do with the heliocentric universe? There's Copernicus uh, centering the planet's uh, orbits around the sun and publishing it after his death so he didn't lose his head or his funding. You know, well, I said, what does this have to do with it? This, this particular questioner said, because it centers everything. You're coming up with the mechanism between physics and biology but it also generates all of the living world, doesn't it? I thought, well, maybe it does. So maybe this thing, we call it the progenote, uh, is this three-way cycling thing, generates all this, and it's potentially an engine of creation. And one could argue that, yes, it affects chemistry, it's growing polymers and, in a, and away from equilibrium system. It's going to teach us how to look for life in the universe. It, it teaches us to wear, uh, life could start on a landmass, and that uh, it might even show us that evolutionary biology could be rethought because the origin, the common ancestor was not an individual, it was a network community of simpler elements. And this goes back to my original vision of when I was 14, the question was like, how can a complex machine emerge? Well, it emerges through a network effect of simpler machines. And we may have found an empirical system that can do that. It even affects metaphysics or spiritual inquiry because you think it wasn't really survival of the fittest at all. It was, it was a network collaborative thing that lifted the living world and probably still is the fundamental driver and unit of selection is the network effect of, of sharing stuff. Uh, this may allow us to actually build true AIs instead of these things that fall over because you could build true learning systems based on these three principles. And it's actually how our economy and politics work, despite those who want to divide us and, and separate us from each other. So it's maybe an engine of creation. So coming up to the end of the life section, my own example of, of relentless conscious attention uh, on this problem maybe shaped pr the probability field that life is to bring an improbable outcome into reality. So here's the vision of Albert Einstein, thought experiment that resulted in this uh, whole massive hypothesis and 
that is now rolling through science. This is a very improbable event that took 40 years, but it's through the power of thought experiments and of course, following up. <clears throat> so everyone okay with all that so far? Does it make logical sense? I know no one's gonna answer, but um, maybe you're all nodding out there. And so I'll carry on to the uh, part that the astronomy geeks like, uh, the search for life in the universe. Bruce, I'll just do a quick time check here. I think we have uh, we want to have some time for questions, and so maybe okay. another five or six minutes, something like that. Okay. All right. So we're going to zip through this section. This is finding stromatolites in Western Australia. This is how we do it. This is what we're going to try to do with Mars 2020, looking potentially, and we probably don't have the right instruments to find stromatolites like we're seeing here. But here we are at the, uh, this is, I was took this picture at the MER landing site selection meeting in January 20, 2003. Here's our last uh, meeting in February. And our final one for Mars 2020's landing site uh, is in October of this year. We're down to three landing sites. We're arguing, our team is arguing that we have to go back to Columbia Hills because in Columbia Hills, we found this home plate. A spirit found evidence of a hot spring by dragging its bum rear wheel through soils we turned up opaline silica, which is the stuff that you saw in Yellowstone. So we're actually at a hot spring on Mars right now. Uh, driving over some rocks and scuffing them, they noticed that this matched the sil nodular silica textures you see in Breccia from El Tatio hot springs in Chile. So we need to break rocks on Mars. So Mars, given that it had a hot spring, we have a plausible chemical model for the origin of life uh, on, an, on a terrestrial world. But it suggests that if life was starting on Mars, it was a race against time because Mars was actively dying. It was losing its atmosphere, its, its oceans, etc. So if my, Mars had a, an origin of life at a hot spring, it could have escaped down through the piping into become deep halophilic extremophiles. And then occasionally that would come up to the surface. So we call this the first and last outpost approach to the search for life on Mars. So it's presented at these landing site meetings. So here's Mars 2020 and here's MER. If we go back here, like a geologist would do, we can search for this ev evidence and collect some samples for return. Enceladus. So here we come to life in the, in the icy world, the water worlds, where we think that these plumes coming off the South Pole are driven by hydrothermal vent systems. So here's your two types of vent systems on the Earth. And you've got uh, more acidic black smokers and alkaline vents. And here's our hydrothermal fields uh, on the Earth. You know, they, they we're making the case that life started there. So how can life start at a hydrothermal vent? Well, we don't think it can because you need extremophile organisms well adapted to these environments that are chemical feeders, but you can't get the chemistry going. So you have salty water, you have dilute conditions, so you can't form your polymers. You can't form membranous vesicles because of the salt either. So you can't do the selection process. Whereas you can do all that at hydrothermal fields. And there are limitations with fields as well. But uh, we're arguing that life really potentially can't start on a, uh, an ice-covered ocean world uh, in those conditions. It may be inoculated later by a big impact delivering biota that were, were adapted. So we're predicting that potentially if you need hydrothermal fields, your Enceladus and Europa may be habitable but lifeless but life may, may have emerged on Mars. And Dave has designed a silicon nanopore to fly through the plume to look for evidence of, of fragments of polymers. But we, we're the null hypothesis, we don't think you'll find it. So here's the last little question. How does this help us understand life beyond our solar system and exoplanets? So here's Kepler-186f, you know, Earth-like, Here's something that would be hot and close. You're not gonna get chemistry working there. You need an aqueous 
environment at the surface. Here's the TRAPPIST-7 system, uh, and it's a tiny solar system that fits in well inside the or orbit of Mercury around a, a red dwarf. So, you know, you could potentially see uh, life on a moon of a gas giant, but what about a red dwarf? What about an aqueous environment, a very, very low energy flux environment, say around uh, TRAPPIST? Well, we, we come back to our original box, our original requirement that to start life, you require polymers with encapsulation and combinatorial selections. No other way to boot up a program like this. And we suggest that aqueous carbon chemistry is the only thing that can do this, not an exotic chemistry, not hard crystals, nothing that's cryogenic. Uh, unless you can propose a chemistry that can do this, these two things, uh, you can't go to life. So with that, I'm gonna wrap it up and thank Night Sky Network and everyone here for uh, hosting this talk. Great, thank you very much, Bruce. This is, uh, this is really very interesting, the process that you all went through and the experimentation, and um, it's really, really fascinating and very thought provoking as, as well. We have a few questions that have popped up, and so from Linda we have, is there any evidence of new original life, not life that has evolved from previous life forms being generated at any time since 3.5 billion years ago? If we still have Goldilocks conditions on Earth, wouldn't life continue to generate independently? That, that is a superb question, and in fact, in that same letter to J.D. Hooker, uh, Darwin writes that life, he, he actually answers this, that basically life can't start again because the, the, of existing life just eat it. It gets, gets eaten up and, and metabolized. And uh, also oxygen, free oxygen in the environment actually is an inhibitor to a lot of our prebiotic chemistry. So in a way life is present, preventing a second genesis. So it's, you know, life is voracious. It's going to consume even a simple protocell. It's not going to survive in the onslaught. Okay, thank you. Lori asks, is there a relationship between the laws of physics and the laws of nature, or do they work against one another? Pregnancy, for example, and we may need to ask her for some clarification on, on that. Well, you know, the big one is the second law of thermodynamics, you know, the therm thermodynamics where things are just breaking down all the time. And so in some sense, the, the laws of the boot up, uh, the, the process of the boot up of life is dependent on being able to surf this chaotic free energy to build stuff against the degrading forces of the second law. So that's where the boundary is. And we are continuously cycled by energy. So for example, if Earth was kicked out of solar orbit, the entire micro uh, complex life world would crash almost instantaneously. We're totally dependent on that sun rising every morning. Okay, um, and I just want to also mention that uh, if you have any questions to please put them in the Q&A box rather than the chat window, that way we can uh, find them easier. Um, Jeffrey asks, how does Earth's oxygen atmosphere affect field testing of hot springs hypothesis? If the tests conducted in anaerobic atmosphere like early Earth, do you see the different results? That's a, also a very good question. Yes, we do have an impact. Luckily, at Bumpus Hell, where we're using the fumarole vents, we're getting the temperatures we need for the polymerization, but we're also getting low oxygen environments there too. I'm headed to New Zealand uh, next uh, in June to work in Rotorua at Hot Springs, and I'm not going to have an anoxic chamber. So I'm hoping that we do get some polymerization uh, when I have little slabs of mineral sitting by the poolside drying down. Uh, yeah, it is a problem. It's an issue. So we probably get we're going to get less product. Okay, Christine asks. Um, could you please elaborate on the mechanism of information exchange in regards to the ability of life to reproduce itself? Well, this is an extremely good question because what we are proposing is a system that doesn't need replication in the beginning. This is the conundrum that's always faced sort of irreducible complexity arguments. Like, 
Well, if you don't have an information system and a complicated way of, of re replication, you can't get life. Well, you can get a kind of reproduction through this cycling pool because you're building protocells and trying them out for free. The cycle makes them. And eventually you get an informational function coupled in to the resynthesis of polymers. And this is the great uh, next experimental frontier in this work. The team that actually can show the first short little informational polymer that can get unwound by a hot water event, natural PCR, template and replicate itself, or partially unwind and make a product, will be a team that's sort of going to be in line for a Nobel Prize, I think. Because that'll be the spontaneous emergence of a genetic function within this cycling system, de novo, from scratch. Okay, Elizabeth asks, is it possible to rebuild an atmosphere? Gosh, you know, our atmosphere was certainly transformed by life. Uh, I think Mars, I, I think it's implausible. I think this is why Mars is a terrible place to to look at building cities, and it's just a nonsense idea, right? But uh, Mars is a, mostly a hard vacuum. It's got perchlorates in the soil, and to actually, the process of putting an atmosphere back into a planet is well beyond our capacity. My other work, we, we focus on the as capture, capture of asteroids in balloon structures, where we introduce atmosphere or extract volatiles from them. That's the Shepard project. And I can do a second talk on that here in the network at some point, where we're introducing atmosphere drawn off from volatiles from planetesimals, and we can create small worlds and do extraction and even mineral extraction. That's a, that's a, a design for NASA for opening the solar system. Uh, you can see that in my TEDx talk at damer.com. So you can do an atmosphere that way, perhaps. So terraforming, uh, we won't be terraforming anything anytime soon, I suppose. So. It's, it's not a very good investment strategy when you can put a balloon around a, an icy object and create a, a, an entire world out of it. Yeah. It's a lot lower cost. Okay, Gordon asks, uh, what keeps protocells from replicating in a way that destroys them? Well, that's a good question. It's good old natural selection. So if they replicate in a way that uh, is, is bad for the, uh, the general, the group of protocells, because these things are being done in a group matrix, uh, then that, that group just gets selected out. That, that process doesn't get pushed forward. Okay. Well, that looks like we've uh, come to the end of uh, the questions. And so I want to thank you again, Bruce, for, um, you know, getting up very early. And, and I think that, uh, you know, I think we met, noted earlier that uh, Bruce is actually in Pakistan um, working on some things. And I, I find it really interesting that you're involved with doing this, but you're also very involved with computers. And it seems like the whole idea of information systems is uh, a common thread between the two. And so it, it, I never really yeah, I thought like, about how they complement each other quite that well. It, it's, it's amazing uh, because in Brian, in 2009, when Dave and I met, here you had one of the great membrane biophysicists in, in the world uh, meeting this a geeky guy that I always think in terms of systems and boot ups and whatnot. And it turns out you needed that kind of computer science approach to tackle the original life problem. And Dave and I, as a partnership, we've been able to do that. And it, it's very much like, uh, who was it that came into geology and was an astrophysicist and just proposed that the asteroid impacts were the cause of the extinction of the dinosaurs. And, and, and so it takes, takes a, uh, a person from outside coming into a field often to solve major uh, conundrums and questions. I think it's a fascinating. Astrobiology, by its very nature, is interdisciplinary, and and this is certainly reaching out to even beyond uh, the you know, the disciplines that we would you know think more likely. So, um, a great collaboration. Thank you so much. This is a uh, very very fascinating, and that's You're all so for welcome. Thank you, and that's all for tonight, everyone. You're